Hey, how's the soiree? It, what? But they're both there, Charles and Charles, and they're not fighting. Wow, that's a Christmas miracle, I guess. Yeah, okay. December 28th, 1940. This is Christmas week, 1940. The season of peace on earth and goodwill to all men. Except it is anything but that. This year, it is a week of bombs and bullets and a week of plans for a future that will involve a great many deaths. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Adolf Hitler issued Directive 21, that for Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, to take place in the late spring of 1941. In North Africa, the British continued their advance and pushed the Italians out of Egypt before stopping the offensive with the Italians under siege at Bardia. The South Africans see success at El Wak, and the Greek counteroffensive against the Italians ran out of steam. Though there is some action on that front this week. On the 23rd, the Greeks occupy Himara, but they end their operations for the time being the 28th to consolidate. They now hold about a quarter of Albania. That same day, Italian leader Benito Mussolini asks Hitler for help in Albania. Hitler declines though, since he plans on hitting Greece from other routes in the new year. He also has no desire to be dragged down by Italian failures. Hitler has had what I suppose could be considered a failure of his own recently, to either invade Gibraltar through Spain or convince Spanish leader Francisco Franco to bring Spain into the war with the Axis powers. This week on the 23rd, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who does not know of the machinations that went on, writes privately to American President Franklin Roosevelt about Spain. An offer by you of food month by month so long as they keep out of the war might be decisive. The occupation by Germany of both sides of the Straits would be a grievous addition to our naval strain, already severe. The Rock of Gibraltar will stand a long siege, but what is the good of that if we cannot use the harbor or pass the Straits? That quote is from The Unseen War in Europe. And here's another thing I found there from Churchill's memoirs. It is fashionable at the present time to dwell on the vices of General Franco, and I am therefore glad to place on record this testimony to the duplicity and ingratitude of his dealings with Hitler and Mussolini. Good turn of the phrase there. But speaking of the states, I talked last week about Hitler's thoughts re the USA, and I'm gonna say a few words about his thoughts regarding his own nation and the USSR now, as he is committed to the Barbarossa plan to invade and conquer the Soviet Union in the late spring of 1941. John Keegan writes a fairly nice monologue about Hitler's table talk monologues regarding Germany. He was obsessed by the story of German history how the Teutonic tribes, alone among people on Rome's western borders, had resisted the powers of the empire, beaten it down, raised warrior kingdoms of their own, and then turned eastward to carry their standards into the Slav lands. The epics of the Teutons, as Viking venturers on the northern seas and founders of princedoms along the Russian rivers, first outposts of civilization in the east, as Norman conquerors of England and Sicily, as knights of the Baltic shore, formed a theme which he returned to night after night and evoked in him the feelings of the manifest destiny of the German race akin to those of the British. Yet, while the British saw the bounds of their world destined to grow wider, Hitler was conditioned by his obsession with the tribulation of the Germans to see them as a people under threat from which they were to be preserved only by unrelenting struggle. The threat was in the east, always in the east. The Slavs, Hungarians, the Jews, and cosmopolitan Bolshevism. And what I mean by that is that Bolshevism to Hitler went counter to his theories of racial singularity and purity by advocating, theoretically at least, a proletariat of the masses. But Hitler's value system had racial singularity at the top of the heap. Bolshevism, and its substitution of faith in economic forces for trust in the warrior's strong arm repudiated the creed of aristocratic populism of which Hitler had found his appeal to his folk. 
So obviously, he had to confront this demon head on and full on and take its land by brute force and then settle it with Germans and Germanic peoples of Northern Europe who otherwise were fated to subjection and enslavement by the myriad hordes of their inferiors. That is a theme that the Axis leaders have, that their national race is superior to the enemies. We've seen that also in the East, in Japan's invasion of China, against not one, but two different Chinese armies. There is news from those armies this week. Nationalist army leader Chiang Kai-shek ordered a few weeks ago that by December 31st, all of Mao Zedong's communist new fourth army be moved north of the Yangtze River and then next month to move north of the Yellow River. And he made clear to Nationalist General Gu Zhutong that if they didn't move, he should make them move. The communists are strong up there in Anhui with some 35,000 troops. And that's an area that used to be a nationalist controlled region. But lately, communist forces have been ordered south of the river, and that concerns Chiang. Xiang Ying is the section commander of the new 4th Army there, and he has assumed that his evacuation will happen in cooperation with nationalist forces, who control some of the river crossings on the way. But this week, he gets a telegram from Mao Zedong's headquarters at Yan'an. You should not have any further false hopes about the nationalists. Do not rely on them to help you with anything. If you end up being attacked by the nationalists on one side and the Japanese on the other side, it will be extremely dangerous for you. Rana Mitter speculates that Mao may have already been shifting blame in case some sort of incident arises, that if something happens to the army in Anhui, then the local commander, and not he himself, would take blame for it. There is also the fact that the communist request for the winter uniforms, money, and supplies to make the journey had been rejected. There is no conflict in the field there, though, at least not for the time being. That actually goes for much of the world. In fact, the only battle actions outside of Greece this week are in the skies and at sea. From the 22nd to the 24th come three straight nights of Luftwaffe bombing raids on Manchester. On the 28th, British Bomber Command learns that repeated bombing of the oil facilities at Geisenkirchen has not been effective, and that's after 28 raids over seven months. At sea on the 25th, the German cruiser Admiral Hippa attacks a British shipping convoy en route to Sierra Leone, 700 miles west of Cape Finisterre. The convoy escort is three cruisers and two carriers though, which is pretty serious. The Hipper sinks one ship, but has to withdraw with engine trouble. On the 27th, the German raider Comet shells the phosphate production facilities on Nauru while flying the Japanese flag. Comet and Orion have been active in the region, sinking ships engaged in phosphate production. And here are a couple of notes to end the week. On the 23rd, Lord Halifax becomes Britain's ambassador to the U.S. Anthony Eden is in as Foreign Secretary and David Margeson as Secretary of War. On the 28th, Soviet spy Richard Sorge reports from Tokyo to Moscow that a German reserve army of 40 divisions is being formed in Leipzig. And the Christmas week comes to an end. Though, again, it is anything but a time of peace on earth and goodwill to all men. The Greeks are stopping to consolidate. The Chinese communists and nationalists may have trouble coming between them and the bombs fly in the air and at sea. This Christmas, the Germans may celebrate a bit harder than usual though. And to the average German citizen, the nation might seem to be at peace, except for the occasional British bombing raid on some major city, but most of them don't live in the major cities. That is important though, because the German economy still has a large, basically peasant agricultural base, unlike Britain by this time. And the German industrial state is a decade or two behind the US. Sure, the Germans at home are getting plenty of stuff from looting the occupied lands, but so far they are being run with stunning economic incompetence. The army hasn't fought in months. The occupied territories are providing the spoils of war, but this lull, this loss of impetus after the months of action may be critical to the events of 1941. See, when you look at what's gone on in the conquered territory and the systems of both government and repression that have been set up, so far, 
Hitler has not set up anything that will lead to a lasting, durable hegemony. Well, he may do that next year, but that seems to me something you'd really want to sort out pretty quickly. And without that, there are cracks in the facade of overwhelming German might. The Kriegsmarine, of course, is not strong enough to either invade Britain or stop Atlantic traffic to and from Britain. The Luftwaffe failed in Britain and, for the moment at least, is under strength for an undertaking such as attacking the Soviet Union. An attack which seems pretty damn definitely happening no matter what happens in Africa or Greece. But you know, there may be another reason lurking in the background for the attack. It seems flippant to suggest that Hitler determined to invade Russia because he could not think what else to do. But there is something in this, as Ian Kershaw has observed. Some generals, privy to their Fuhrer's intentions, already understood the Third Reich's fundamental difficulty. Anything less than hemispheric domination threatened disaster, yet Germany's military and economic capability to achieve this remained questionable. It seems very much that all or nothing is how it has to be for the German Reich. Perhaps that means 1941 will end the war one way or the other. We shall see. Happy holidays. Now, this is the holiday season. And over on our Time Ghost channel, we're doing a series of nine specials to celebrate the holidays. You can check out the playlist for that right here. Our Patreon supporter this holiday week is Miguel Moreno. We cannot express enough gratitude to supporters like Miguel for their vital contributions because every dollar really does count and makes this series more thorough and more comprehensive. And every dollar will count in 1941, which is a huge year for the Second World War, and that begins in just a few days. Remember that, folks. And also, remember to subscribe and ring the bell, and I will see you in 1941.